Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a delight to be here and to uh, remember all that we've done and take a pause and look where we're going to go with our, with our church and with our faith. You know, I'm a traveler. That's what I do. I've spent a third of my adult life living out of a 9 by 14 by 22 inch carry on the airplane size suitcase. And uh, I travel uh, to Europe and I make all sorts of mistakes and I take careful notes and I uh, bring them home and, home and package them into guidebooks and so on in hopes that people can learn from my mistakes rather than their own and travel smoother. When I get ripped off, I celebrate. They don't know who they just I'll ripped just off. I'm going to learn that good. scam and take it home and teach people about it. And, you know, it's sort of my calling. And I've been thinking a lot about the priesthood of all believers and how we can make our daily walk of life a spiritual act. And uh, before I even ever heard that concept of the priesthood of all believers, as a, as a student, I sort of uh, debated with myself, do I really want to dedicate my life to teaching people how to travel? Is that a good thing? When I, my very first memories of travel, I don't know if you remember this, but I remember way back when I was little, the first notion of travel was rich white Americans on luxury cruise ships in the Caribbean, throwing coins off the deck and photographing what they called the little dark kids jumping for their coins. And I just thought, that's not the kind of travel I want to promote. That, that, that exacerbates the difference between us and the rest of the world. And even at that stage, I thought, I want to travel in a way that brings us closer together. And um, even to this day, I think for a lot of Americans, travel still is, see if you can eat five meals a day and still snorkel when you get into port. Um, <laughs> It's not travel. I mean, that's hedonism. I don't say that in a, in a judgmental way. I, I'm a Lutheran. I've got no problem with hedonism. But, um, <laughs> but I just really want travel to come together. So I got to sort of decide my notion of travel is uh, activity where we get to know the rest of the world. And uh, in that sense, I find that I get energy because when I teach, I'm teaching travel as a spiritual act. Getting close to creation. I mean, can you, as I said, Europe's my beat. Hiking in the Alps, walking on a ridge, actually tight roping on a ridge high above the valleys. On one side, you got lakes stretching all the way to Germany. On the other side, you got the most incredible alpine panorama anywhere, the Eiger, Monk, and Jungfrau. And ahead of you, you hear the long legato tones of an Alphorn announcing that the helicopter-stocked mountain hut is open. It's just around the corner, and the coffee schnapps is on. I mean, that's enough to make a Lutheran go like this. You know? <laughs> When people ask me, what's your favorite cathedral, I'm inclined to say, on top of the Alps on a sunny day. I mean, it's just, you love creation when you, when you get out to see it. Travel also helps us celebrate diversity, and that can be taught as a spiritual act. My very first powerful lesson as a traveler was when I was just a little 14-year-old kid in Oslo. Uh, I was with my mom and dad in Frogner Park, the big park behind the royal palace there. And I remember as a kid, marveling at how my parents just loved me, almost ridiculously. And then I remember looking out in that park, and it was speckled with other families, a vast park, like a beautiful Monet painting, filled with other parents loving their children. And it hit me, wow, this, home, this world is home to billions of equally precious children of God. I just thought, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful value of travel. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have noticed that otherwise had it not gotten out. Since 9-11, I've found that my work as a travel writer has taken on a new dimension, a travel writer as a spiritual act. And it's to challenge Americans to get out and get to know the rest of the world, to gain an empathy for the other 96% of humanity, to overcome our fear. We've become quite a fearful nation since 9-11, I think. And I find that fear is for people who don't get out very much. The flip side of fear is understanding, and we gain understanding when we reach out. And when we travel thoughtfully, I think we're able to come home with what is the most beautiful souvenir, and that's a broader perspective, a sense that we're all children of God. Now, fear, I think, is something that we need to be inspired to stand up against. And when I think back about Martin Luther, one of the reasons I'm able to get excited about certain historical events like Martin Luther and the Reformation, is not looking at it from a 21st century perspective. A German monk translated the Bible. OK, that's good. Um, <laughs> no, look at it from a perspective of the 1400s and understand what kind of courage that must have taken. 
The closest thing I can think of in our time would be that iconic image on Tiananmen Square of the lone Chinese heretic standing in front of that tank. Imagine that. Imagine Martin Luther standing in front of the tank of the, of the day, the Holy Roman Emperor, the Roman Church, all of that. Wow, I'm just inspired by that. Now, at the 500th anniversary point, we can enjoy looking back, but we can take a pause and we can look forward. And we can think, what are the challenges confronting us as a community, as a church? I think a lot of it is globalization. I don't know how Luther could have imagined globalization, but globalization is, in a lot of ways, the challenge of our age. It's shaping a lot of our politics. It's shaping a lot of our fear. It's shaping a lot of the challenges that confront us as a nation. I think in the developing world, south of the border, I've been told globalization is just like a big train. You got to get on it or you're going to get run over. Uh, north of the border, globalization, we're sort of riding high on it. And I think the consequence of globalization for us is just fear that the rest of the world is, is, is going to challenge us. And this is a challenge for us in the church. I think as Christians of a mighty nation, Christian citizens of a mighty nation, we have to decide how we're going to react to this challenge. We've got a dramatic and fundamental choice. I think it's walls or bridges. And we really have to decide what is God calling us to do? What's, what is our stance on that? And what is appropriate as we deal with this unprecedented challenge? One thing great about travel is we get out and we recognize that the diversity on this planet is something to celebrate. It's not something to be afraid of. It's not something that you even want to build walls against. But if you didn't get out and see that, I don't think you'd be able to come to that rev revelation. Now, for me as a tour guide, I love to expose my travelers to opportunities to shake up their fear and realize that getting to know the rest, to humanize the rest of the world is a beautiful thing. When we get out and humanize people we don't understand, they become less fearful. It makes it tougher for their propaganda to demonize us, and it makes it tougher when we go home for our propaganda to demonize them. A good example for me is in eastern Turkey. I went to a village. I think I might have been the first American that wandered into that village. It was kind of big news. The mayor took me to his home. We're all dancing and having an impromptu party. He's excited. There's an American there. He takes me over to the most holy place in his home, the place where he hangs his Quran bag. I'll never forget this. He introduced me to his Quran bag. He said, this is the most sacred place in my home. And in my Quran bag, I also keep a copy of the Torah and a copy of the Bible. Because he said, I figure we're all children of the book, people of the book, children of the same heavenly father. And I just thought, I'm so thankful I had the opportunity to step out and get to be exposed to that beautiful perspective. Another example as a tour guide that I just love is taking something that might be a little frightening and humanizing it. Something that might be a little just crazy to an American perspective. A whirling dervish. You might have seen them on cruise ship entertainment. What's going on with that guy, you know? Well, I wanted to know. I'm steep on the learning curve. So I, I, I was in uh, Turkey. I met a dervish. And I talked to him. And I said, okay, can you explain to me what's happening? He says, I'm a dervish. I'll just paraphrase this. In a, simple kind of way, but he said basically, uh, I'm a dervish. I, I, that's a, what you Christians would call a monk. And uh, my prophet is Mevlana. I think you might refer to him as uh, Rumi. And Mevlana is the prophet of love, he's like, you're, like you're Saint Francis, easy to get your brains around that. And he said, five times a day I meditate on the teaching of Mevlana, and I get myself into a meditative trance by spinning. And he explained the, the physical action of this prayer. I plant one foot in my home my family, my community. The other hand, the other foot goes around and celebrates the diversity in God's great creation. One hand goes up to accept the love of our maker, and the other hand, like the spout on a tea kettle, goes down to shower God's love on his beautiful creation, on my home, on my family, and in all that diversity. And he said, I lose myself in those thoughts as I whirl. And I, I endeavor to become a conduit of God's love. Oh, man, I just thought, this is the wonder of travel. 
And I just thought, this is why we need to step out. Now, Luther was an intolerant guy living in an intolerant time. I don't think inclusivity was one of his fortes. <laughs> but I got a hunch if Luther lived today, I, I'm fascinated by how would he grapple with globalization and these kind of challenges. I think he'd be a bridge, bridges rather than a walls kind of Christian. And it is so exciting and joyful for me to sit here today for this uh, beautiful gathering and, and be able to have us all together underline the, the fundamental rightness of us seeing us all as children of God in all of our different walks of life. I'd like to just close with it. I'm just going to try this. I've got a prayer. It's a Lutheran prayer, but I'm going to do it as a dervish. And if you can imagine our foot in our hometown celebrating the diversity on this planet. Dear God, we gather to celebrate this 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and as we do, inspire us to action. Give us the faith-fueled courage of Martin Luther. Help us to see, as Luther did, that when we celebrate life, we celebrate our Creator, and that we love you best when we love our neighbor, especially our neighbor in need. Whether we're blessed with the opportunity to travel or not, let us see all of humanity as your children and therefore our brothers and sisters. As we celebrate your gift of grace proclaimed in 1517, inspire us now to be conduits of your love so that we can shower it on all of your creation. Guide us now as we invigorate the Lutheran Church with our leadership and with our creative energy. And lead us as we step boldly into our next 500 years as Lutheran Christians working with our ecumenical and interfaith partners to do your will. Amen. Thank you very much. And now I am eager to ask Bishop Eaton a few questions uh, that have, uh, we've probably a lot of us have been thinking about. And uh, Bishop Eaton, thank you. Uh oh he had just hit a heavy sigh. I'm a little I've got, concerned now. <laughs> I've got 20 minutes to go through a lot of questions. And so, <laughs> you know, sitting here today and having a chance to be thinking of all of the dimensions of our faith, it's interesting to come back to the kind of a, a fundamental question that Lutherans who just feel in our gut that our heart pitter-patters when we hear a, a mighty fortress is our God and so on. What distinguishes Lutherans from other Protestants and other Christians, if you were to put it in a nutshell. I bet you could say it all in one word. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually our, our answer, um, but long before Luther, uh, long before St. Paul, who was himself, I think, a proto-Lutheran, um, <laughs> long before Jesus, uh, we read in the Hebrew scriptures, we call it the Old Testament, that God out of God's generosity and mercy chose a people, not because of qualifications, but out of God's good pleasure, chose a people. So grace is something that's important for, for um, not only Christian and Lutheran Christian uh, traditions, but also um, from our elder brothers and sisters in the faith. And I can think you can hear the same thing in Islam. What's unique about the Lutheran message is that we think that grace does two things. It frees us from uh, not only I'll do the catechism, sin, sickness, and death, or sin, sickness, and the devil, frees us from that and from this, uh, this horrible sense that we'll never measure, measure up, that we're trapped in in ourselves, which frees us from that, but it also frees us for something else. I think one of the genius things that um, Luther uh, helped us to understand is that um, when we are free, set free, we're now freed in Christ to serve the neighbor, which now we, means, just as you were saying a moment ago, we get to look at everybody out there as people who are deeply precious and fascinating to God. And so we serve them not because we're going to use them as objects or something in our little um, uh, project to earn eternal favor, but because we are free to do that and we're not objectifying people. So I think. That was more than a word, but That's, there you have it. <laughs> so um, I just feel it's just so innate to me or whatever that we're all children of God. And if we're all children of God, 
we, we need to get to know the family and we need to love each other like brothers and sisters. Uh, what from Luther's actual teaching would lead you to think he would um, endorse all that we've talked about today with interfaith faiths and ecumenical ideas? Uh, because, of course, during the Reformation, even the great reformers were fighting each other to the death. Well, um, taking our cue from this morning's conversation, we're not going to sort of minimize uh, that Luther was an intolerant man in an intolerant age. So he might not agree with this, but when we do our work ecumenically and interreligiously, we hold up a couple of things. One is that no human being can determine the limits of God's grace. And no human being can say God's grace goes this far and no farther. So that's, that's one thing. And also... It, Lutherans, and so those of you who are not Lutherans or Catholics, we number our commandments differently. So for us, the eighth commandment is, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And when Luther does an explanation about that, it's not just don't lie or slander your neighbor, but what you really need to do is, is to promote your neighbor and think well of your neighbor and put the best possible construction on what your neighbor is doing or saying. And you can't do that unless you know your neighbor. And so those two things, I think, are part of our Lutheran tradition that say God is greater than us. We cannot imagine how far God's love extends, and we dare put limits to that. And it's not just the theory of your neighbor. We need to know our neighbor just as God knows our neighbor. There's more, but that, we'll leave it there. You know, um, I'm so proud of the work our Lutheran church does in acknowledging Jesus' uh, concern for the poor. And I'm frustrated with a lot of other Christian denominations from my perspective that they don't prioritize just flat out take care of poor people as much as I think they might. What in Luther's teaching is the root of the, the enthusiasm Lutherans have for taking care of the poor compared to other denominations that would prioritize other things? Well, I'm not going to speak for other denominations. I wouldn't dare do that, particularly not today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is this sense that Luther had. Um, he did say on his deathbed, we are all beggars. And so the sense that this, the life that we have comes to us as a gift that's been given to us freely. And when we take a look around at other people and they are not experiencing the, the abundance of life that Jesus talked about in John uh, chapter 10, then because we've been set free and given these gifts, then we should make sure that's happening for other people. And Luther was, he was pretty, in his blunt way, uh, pretty determined that that should be the way that the church and the society should operate. So when we uh, pray the Lord's Prayer and talk in the fourth petition, give us this day our daily bread. Um, Luther, Luther included in that, if you remember from your small catechisms, or for those of you who've done the large catechism, that's quite an expanded list. Good food, good name, good, a good job, good government. That's something that should be for everyone. And in the explanation in the large, tes uh, large testament, um, pardon me, large catechism, sorry, everyone. Um, Luther expands that to say that the coat of arms of the prince, which would have been the government of the day, should be loaves of bread because the, the, it's the duty of the prince and the church uh, supporting that to make sure that all are fed. And he said when he did a um, commentary on Psalm 82 that the whole kingdom or the government at that time should be a hospital so that those who are most vulnerable and cannot afford health care, this is Luther, not me, that, that that should be available. And Luther early on started something called a community chest, which is sort of like welfare, so that those people who are in need in the community could be supported by those people who had something to give. That's just part of who we are. When I was a student, I read a book called uh, something like Reading the Bible Through Third World Eyes. And uh, you're the presiding bishop of the uh, Lutheran Church in the richest country on this planet. Um, what are your thoughts about how rich Christians might interpret the Bible differently than uh, Christians who are hungry uh, south of the border. Well, I and uh, my, my sister Susan Johnson, Bishop in uh, Canada, and others have been to the Lutheran World Federation uh, Assembly in Namibia, and I was, I've also had experiences with companion synods or uh, traveling around the world. And it's interesting um, how where people feature themselves in parables of Jesus. <laughs> so. You tell us the story of, of the Good Samaritan. And where do we all go? We're the Good Samaritan, right? We always think that. And then other people are always the priest and the Levite and everyone crossing over on the other side of the street. 
And when we go to places in the global south or in developing places, they see themselves as a man in the ditch. And so we immediately, I think, at least have the privilege in, in this church of assuming that we're the ones who are going to do the good and not the ones who need the help. Um, and also, uh, you know, the work that we do with ELCA World Hunger and in uh, concert with, um, with other uh, relief agencies, Caritas with the Roman Catholic Church, um, Islamic Aid with, the, with, um, with Muslims, uh, works that we do with the Jews, um, we, we want to make sure that, that people see how some ways that we insist that products be grown actually be, be raised be, is actually a, a detriment to people's lives. So, you know, if, if a cash crop is bananas and then all the people plant are bananas, they're not going to feed themselves because they're exporting it to us. So that's, we have to be mindful of that. I think that's it's a, an important key every time we eat something, if we renew the trail that it came by, and if we remember it ultimately comes from God as a gift, maybe we would say it's not just ours to do with as we will. It's a big leap to take that into the voting booth with us. No, it isn't. Just go into the voting booth with you. and. So when you <laughs> step into the voting booth, uh, a lot of us would be inclined just to vote for our own financial self-interest in the privacy of the voting booth. To me, that would be um, a real personal challenge is to take your faith and know that it's okay to take it into the voting booth. Is this the government question you were trying yeah. to answer? <laughs> <laughs> That, that's become, we've, we have found um, since, since the, uh, the election last November that that's become a very um, almost um, neuralgic point for a lot of our people who are, are, are good, decent people, um, but how politicized things have come and the misunderstanding that I would say, at least in our uh, ELCA tradition, that people have about the role of church and people of faith in the public square. So we had this... Um, this, this happened in uh, the New Jersey Synod, and an, an enraged parishioner called our bishop there and said uh, to, to her, listen, the pastor deliberately, deliberately chose a passage to criticize the administration. And the bishop was all flustered. What do you mean? Then finally she said, well, what was the passage? The Beatitudes. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're hearing um, our Lord with new ears, and that's important, but that's just how charged things are. But... You know, for, for Lutherans, there's, we, we do not withdraw from the world. That is not our spiritual tradition to withdraw from the world. Um, and so uh, from the beginning, we hear that Luther made, wanted to make sure that the most vulnerable were taken care of, that they were educated, that they had health care, that they would be fed. That's part of the Lutheran movement. Um, we hear about Luther's um, doctrine of the two kingdoms or the two ways that God uh, cares for the world. The, and people want to automatically say that the secular is not as important as the spiritual. And that the church should not worry about the secular and just spend time with the spiritual. However, God is present in both of those things. And Lutherans, when we pray the Lord's Prayer and talk about give us today our daily bread, it is for good government. And that means we need to be active citizens. Also, um, I think a lot of ways we've sort of bifurcated the material and the spiritual and some, this is the better, the spiritual part, and the material we're always trying to escape. But we understand God coming to us in the flesh, that who shared our life, and that this world which God created was good at the time of the creation is something that's equally precious. And you can't just have a hierarchy of what's more important and what isn't. And for those of us, of us who are member of, um, citizens of this country, the first commandment says that the, the government's not going to establish a religion, it's, or nor will it um, prohibit the free exercise thereof. Separation of church and state means the government stays out of the church, but the church should be active in the public square. And that's part of our witness. That's a huge distinction. I mean, a lot of people just think it goes both ways, but that's, that makes a lot of sense. Read your First Amendment. <laughs> You're in a great place to read it in this. Yeah. <laughs> Separation of church and state. Reiterate that again, separation of church and state. I, People, I, I hear this all, all the time, especially if I'm saying something that they think, or our pastors or deacons are, that they consider political, usually on either side, liberal or conservative, it's something they don't agree with. But the government shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. So separation of church and state is that the government's not going to mess around in houses of faith or in, in the faith community. 
It says nothing about not only the right, but I would say as Christians, the duties and of other people of faith, the duty of us to be active in the public square. And that was Thomas Jefferson. So. <laughs> So uh, we're at uh, the 500 year point here. It's fun to look back, but I know this is the time to pause and look forward. As you look forward where we're at now, um, what big challenges do you see for us as a church? They asked this, this question at the BBC this morning. All right. <laughs> we were on the BBC, it was pretty exciting. And I think increased secularization. Uh, every Christian tradition, just about every Christian tradition, and I would say also if we were to talk to our Muslim and Jewish uh, brothers and sisters, they were seeing a, a decline or a plateauing in membership. So belonging to an organized religion is something um, that's more difficult, I think. Um, I think we are all, no matter what our religious tradition, but I'll say specifically to my, uh, my Lutheran family, we are in a new missionary age. It is probably pretty sure that the Roman Empire did not give Christians Sundays off back in the beginning. And our church, um, along with many other in this country, have had a, a, um, a position of privilege in this country where it was expected. I'm old enough to remember President Eisenhower say, attend the church or synagogue of your choice. And so that was part of your civic duty. That's not the case anymore. And in fact, you know, as painful as it is, it also might be a gift, this kind of um, uh, metal sharpening steel, sharpening steel that uh, we heard earlier today, or, or the image of the vine and the branches that the, the, the vine dresser does have to prune this stuff back. And then um, for our uh, part of the, the Christian movement, especially in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, we are a multicultural church, not to deny the, the, the gifts, the, um, the, the, the wisdom, and the participation of people of color in our in our denomination here, but we're also the whitest denomination in the United States. And part of our, 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 our uh, how are we gonna, you know, we settled it in the first century that one did not have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. Well, does one have to become a Norwegian or anybody else from <laughs> Europe in order to become a Lutheran? And that, that is one we have not been able, we're making some inroads, we're trying to be intentional, we say this is something we wanna do, well, people are waiting to see if it'll, if it'll happen. So that's another thing. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is, you know, we're, we are supposed to be in the death and resurrection business. Well, you know, we're not. We want to hold on to what we have. And if you do that, you strangle it. And if we really believe in God, then maybe we should have the, the hope to be this, that something new is going to happen. And if God has a role for, the, for uh, an evangelical Lutheran Church of America witness, uh, in America, witness to the gospel, nothing can stop us. If God has decided that he's done with us and needs to raise up another voice, there's nothing we can do to prevent that. It's up to God and we need to get on board. You know, I've, I've noticed in my travels that um, people of faith, Christians in poor countries, seem to live their lives with a mindset of abundance and ironically, a lot of Christians in the wealthiest part of the world live their lives with a mindset of scarcity. Um, do you think our affluence threatens our, our faith? Because I just, I feel more, there's more, there's a lot of energy in Africa right now. That oh. sounds really scriptural there, Rick. Good yeah. for you. I don't know if you've ever read the book Michael Pollan in Defense of Food. Have any of you read that book? And he makes the point that now we have um, artificially injected food with all the nutrients we really need so that you can actually buy heart-healthy Twinkies. And, uh, mm. and so we, we're doing this instead of eating the food yeah. that we need. And so in fact, we could be full to the brim and at the same time be starving to death. And I think in a, in a culture where um, you, you, we, and God forbid that we should ever have to, we don't have to work hard every single minute to make sure we or our children are fed most of us, there are still too many people in this country for whom that is true, um, but we get too full. And then there's, where is there room for God? Um, I was um, up in Shishmaref, so a shout out to the American Indian Alaska Native folks here. Uh, Shishmaref is up in, uh, in, you can't see Russia from there, but it's pretty close to where you can. <laughs> it's that far north. And uh, 
it's with a congregation, there are hunter-gatherers there still. If they don't have a successful seal hunt, a good fish camp in the summer, a good caribou hunt, they're going to be without protein. It's the truth. But in those folks are part of the Seward um, Peninsula Lutheran uh, group, um, and they, in fact, are taking up offerings for the God's global barnyard so that other people mm. can have something to eat and have a dignity in life, be able to become self-sustaining, regain their agency. And, and, and they're not having a sense, if I give that money to those people, then my people won't eat. It's, it's not like that. I get a sense that... Um... Uh, there's a reasonable concern that we're an aging demographic in the ELCA. Uh, what is the church doing to uh, encourage young people to take leadership roles and, and get involved? I'll defer to my brother and sister bishops who are here if you would like to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, um, yes we are, and I don't for a minute want to minimize the contribution of those saints, gray-haired saints, um, who are, in our, who are our base and are in their congregations, but is there some way that we can learn to let go of power um, and move out of the way? And then also uh, find ways, um, in fact, where people of all ages, but folks you might not expect to be world leaders, are doing that. So your story, Pastor, about seeing the hatred growing in your town and the courage you and the doctor had to say, no, we're gonna say something about that. That's a young adult. Um, bringing leadership to the church, can we recognize that and get out of the way of, of, of that happening instead of saying, no, you haven't earned your stripes yet. Mm -hmm. In the church, we're not always really good at that. Um, in other places in the world, the church is very, very young, not only in, in how long they've been in existence, but also in the age of, of, their, of their people. I think in Cambodia, the Lutheran church in Cambodia, the average age is like, what, 19 or something? Yeah, so it's possible, but that's, we, we gotta get out of the way. So we have this, um wonderful challenge, really, to um, stand by our Muslim neighbors when there's so much fear in our society and there's so much hatred. Um, what is your thought on the, on the rise of fear in the United States? It just seems to me powerful people are trying to use fear against us. Fear is a very powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Fear alienates and keeps people separate from one another. And as you found out, fear prevents people from seeing God in the other person. And travel was able to, for you, mm -hmm. as a political and a spiritual act, can dispel that. But no, that's, it's definitely there. And I'm surprised. Um, I was at St. Luke in Silver Spring on Sunday morning, and these are German immigrants. And uh, they remember, and we take, if you take a look at the 1917 observance of the Reformation, it was incumbent upon all the Germans to disavow any Germanness. And during the First World War, Germans in this, of dis, German descent in this country, as well as in Australia, their churches burned or they changed their names. How did we forget that that quickly? And now say somehow, if you're not like us, you're not real, we're gonna be afraid of you. And you wonder about that. Um, if we see someone, and immediately I see an archetype of an entire myth instead of a human being, that keeps us from seeing each other. And I think that's being used I think preying on our fears is being used as a tool by, by, by people to keep us separated or keep us motivated. And uh, it's interesting to me, I had a chance to be at the uh, Elizabeth Detention Center in Elizabeth, New Jersey, which really literally is a warehouse where uh, people who are undocumented are going seeking asylum. And uh, it's for profit. It's a for profit institution. In my home county of um, Ashtabula, we have uh, a for profit prison. When that came to our county, we were all really happy because it was some sign of economic development. Mm -hmm. But what we have then is poor people guarding poor people and people in power getting really rich by separating and dividing us. Mm -hmm. And we might be implicit or complicit in that mm -hmm. division that happens if, we, if, we, if, we're, if we're participating in that or wow. not speaking out about that. Boy, we have the power and privilege in this church and a lot of this to say, that's just not right. The way Martin Luther showed his courage by standing up to what he saw as church corruption, I think today the equivalent would be standing up to institutionalized uh, structural poverty and institutionalized racism. And for us to be inspired to have the same sort of bold stance, mm -hmm. that might be a way to see the Reformation today, 500 years later. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. All right. Um, 
I think when we start, we, you've met, we've named it here several times, but I'll just, you don't have to raise your hands, my white brothers and sisters, but how many of us get a little, little uh, perturbed or defensive when we start to talk about white privilege? Mm. You know, we earn what we do, we work hard. Mm -hmm. And I remember a colleague gave me a book, I think it was called The Color of Money, and it talked about the GI Bill that happened um, right after the Second World War. Well, my dad flew B-24s in the Second World War. He flew over North Africa and Italy. He was a brave man. He didn't want to talk about the actual combat experiences, but he did that. And when he came back, he was eligible for the benefits of the GI Bill. You know who the, the escort squadron was for my dad? The Tuskegee Airmen, the mm -hmm. Red Tails. When they came back because they weren't white, they were not eligible for any of those benefits. Yeah. Well, you know, my dad doesn't mean he didn't work hard and you know, raise his family, wasn't a loving man and a patriot, but the, living, the playing field is not level, and we know that now. And so do we have the courage, or maybe just the, we can be afraid. You can still be scared and we can be defensive, but do we have the faith to believe, for those of us in the Christian tradition, that if in baptism we have been buried with Christ in a death like his, therefore we have already died the only death that really matters, that if we stand against this, we might lose our lives, mm. but not our eternal life in, in mm. Christ. Mm. So that's kind of up to us, up to, us to do that. Mm. Amen, uh. amen. Wow. So uh, to, uh, to uh, wrap things up, I, when I was making our uh, public television show about Martin Luther and Reformation, I got this joy of trying to find quotes that would fit into the show from Martin Luther, and he's so full of quotes. Well, some are not allowed in polite <laughs> company, actually. <laughs> yeah. Can't have it on public television, no. that's for sure. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm just curious, number one, uh, what is a, a particular quote of Martin Luther that resonates with you that you love to share? And secondly, uh, as a teacher and a, and, a, and a pastor, you must have some of your own phrases. Which one would you like to share with that you think Martin Luther would enjoy? <laughs> That's a hard one, Rick. Mm. <laughs> you had time to think about it. I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. One time um, in, in my synod office, uh, our staff and I Googled Luther quotes about um, certain bodily functions and found that there are quite a few to be found on the end. <laughs> Those are not my favorite uh, ones at all. Um, one, I think one that's, um, that's uh, used and maybe abused a little bit, I have it from uh, the Lutheran campus ministry at the University of Chicago, and it says, Lutherans sinning boldly since 1517. <laughs> and, and Luther's, the, the first part of that quote would remember, you know, sin boldly, uh, but it also says, and trust even more boldly in the grace of Christ. And the point was, I think Luther's trying to make, when we get so bound up about protecting ourselves and make sure we're doing it right, first of all, we forget it's about God's grace and not our effort. So Lutherans are into works righteousness, just to say that on this auspicious um, anniversary. Um, but if, if we go for it, try our best, we're going to fail. But if we don't try, not, we're not going to know. And trying and failing is a way of confessing our faith in God, who if we believe God will pick us up and dust us off and send us on the road again, if we really believe that, then we can do things. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that one. That's Mine, right. golly, I don't know. Have, maybe my husband would know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, don't say that one, okay. <laughs> well, I, I just think it would be great if he was sitting right here today and seeing how far our denomination, our, our church has come. Mm -hmm. And this celebration of diversity, to me, it's something that is... Uh, huge accomplishment uh, going, of course, with the Roman Catholic Church and far beyond that. Mm -hmm. and, and our ecumenical partners. Are, it's just a, a beautiful thing, and I thank, uh, I'm so thankful to, be, uh, to have the ELCA, and I think all of us can be very thankful for your leadership and your inspiration. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>